Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN, reminding you that it is the season to enhance your internet experience with a VPN, among other things. Do you remember what the internet was like in 1997, telling your sister to get off the phone so you could check your email, waiting 30 or 40 seconds just to hear that you've got mail, or so those ugly websites loading in busted HTML? The internet has changed a lot in 25 years, but millions of people still surf the web as if Dave Grohl never got off the drums. It's time to bring your surfing habits to the 21st century with NordVPN. Protect yourself from IP trackers with NordVPN. Nord's military grade encryption. It works great whether you've got a Mac or a PC. Then look, a common misconception is that VPNs are just people who want to play defense, but they're not just for protecting yourself. You'd be amazed at the different streaming options you have when you jump on a server from another country. Protect yourself or just play around, buy it for yourself, or consider it as a gift for another internet user in your life. With NordVPN, you've got lots of options, and right now, you guys can take advantage of a special holiday deal that NordVPN is running. Any purchase of a two year plan comes with a huge discount, plus an additional month for free. And if you make a purchase and decide a VPN isn't for you, NordVPN offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. There's never been a better time to enhance your online experience with NordVPN, so head to nordvpn.com forward slash brainfood or use the code brainfood at checkout. And now today's video. When Allied troops liberated the first Nazi concentration camps in 1945, they uncovered horrors beyond imagination. Over the 12 years of the Third Reich's existence, the regime had arrested and imprisoned millions of Jews, Romani, Poles, homosexuals, communists, and other so-called undesirables across Germany and occupied Europe. Some were used as slave labor in service of German industry, while others were sent directly to death camps like Auschwitz, Birkenau, and Treblinka for extermination by gas chamber. Still others were subjected to cruel, inhuman experiments such as being frozen in ice baths to study hypothermia, given infected wounds to develop better battlefield treatments, or injected with caustic chemicals to sterilize their sexual organs. To prevent such horrors from ever being repeated, in 1947 an American tribunal laid out the Nuremberg Code, a set of ethical guidelines for conducting scientific research on human subjects. Among the code's ten core principles are that voluntary, informed consent must always be obtained from the subjects and that the experiment should yield results which are useful to society and unobtainable by other means, and that the degree of risk to the subject should never exceed the humanitarian benefit expected from the results of the treatment. But the demands of war so often override such high-minded principles, and as the Second World War gave way to the Cold War, the United States began conducting its own series of highly unethical human experiments. And among the most secret and insidious of these projects involved injecting unwitting civilians with radioactive plutonium. When the Manhattan Project was launched in early 1942, scientists knew of only one material which could be used to build an atomic bomb, the fissile isotope uranium-235. Comprising only 0.72% of natural uranium, U-235 had to be separated from the more common but non-fissile isotope U-238 in order to produce weapons-grade nuclear fuel. This was a slow, painstaking process, and despite running three massive enrichment facilities, Around the clock, at top secret Site Y in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Manhattan Project scientists doubted they could produce enough U-235 to build even a single bomb before January 1945. Thankfully, there was an alternative. Plutonium. Discovered in February 1941 by chemist Glenn Seaborg at UC Berkeley, plutonium does not occur in nature and is produced by bombarding U-238 with neutrons. This allows it to be bred in nuclear reactors far more efficiently than U-235 can be enriched. Construction thus began in February 1943 on the pilot scale X-10 plutonium production reactor at Oak Ridge, which served as the testbed for the larger industrial scale B, D, and F reactors at Site W in Hanford, Washington. But as Oak Ridge and Hanford geared up for full-scale plutonium production, the Manhattan Project directors faced a looming crisis. Up until this point, plutonium had only ever been produced in minuscule quantities using cyclotron particle accelerators, and little was known about the health risks this exotic new material would pose to the hundreds of workers he would soon be handling it every day. Not only was plutonium potentially toxic, but as an alpha particle emitter, even a small quantity absorbed into the body could expose workers to dangerous amounts of radiation and long-term health risks like cancer. In order to quantify this risk and develop procedures to protect workers, in July 1942, four Project Health sections were established. A Chicago section under Robert Stone, a Los Alamos section under Lewis Hempelman, a Berkeley section under Joseph Hamilton, and a Rochester section 
under Wright Langham. The health secretary's first order of business was to establish safety procedures and exposure limits for workers handling plutonium. Laboratory floors were coated in linoleum to facilitate dust management. Workers were made to wear rubber gloves and respirators, and eating in the labs was banned to prevent plutonium from being absorbed through the skin, lungs, or digestive tract. Lacking empirical data on exposure limits, the medical section researchers based their initial assumptions on the behavior of better-known metals like radium and uranium. Radium, which was once widely used to make luminous paint for clock and watch dials mimics the element calcium and is deposited mainly in the bones, where it can irradiate the marrow, resulting in cancers like leukemia. And for more on this, please do check out our previous video, Glowing in the Dark, The Radium Girls, and Does Anything Radioactive Actually Glow Bright Green? Based on this existing data, Robert Stone at the Chicago section estimated that 20 to 30 micrograms of plutonium constituted a lethal dose and set the maximum exposure limit for workers at 5 micrograms. Still, many questions remained as to how exactly plutonium entered the body, where in the body it was deposited, and how much was excreted versus retained by the body. There was also the problem of monitoring workers' plutonium absorption. While radium exposure could be monitored by measuring the amount of radioactive radon gas expelled by the lungs, this was not possible with plutonium. It was also not possible to simply run a radiation detector over a worker's body, as the alpha radiation emitted by plutonium was almost all absorbed by the surrounding tissues. This left only three available monitoring methods. Nose swabs, which estimated the amount of plutonium absorbed by the lungs, blood analysis, and urine analysis. But the researchers still needed empirical data on how plutonium levels in the nose, blood, and urine correlated to levels in the body itself. So, in January 1944, the first precious micrograms of reactor-bred plutonium from Oak Ridge were shipped to Berkeley and Chicago for use in animal experiments. These studies involved administering small doses of plutonium to rats, mice, rabbits, and dogs via inhalation, ingestion, and intravenous, intramuscular, and subcutaneous injection, and measuring the plutonium content of their urine and feces over a period of several days. These experiments yielded a number of surprising results. For example, it was discovered that very little plutonium is absorbed by the digestive system or through the skin. Conversely, around 20% of inhaled plutonium was absorbed into the body, while 25% was retained in the lungs themselves. The only other major absorption route was wound contamination, such as in the hypothetical case of a flask of plutonium solution shattering in a worker's hand and puncturing the skin. Tests also revealed that unlike radium, 99% of which is absorbed through the bones, only around 50% of plutonium is bone-seeking, the rest being deposited largely in the liver kidneys. And while the acute radiation toxicity of plutonium was found to be less severe than anticipated, the acute lethal dose being between 400 and 4,000 micrograms per kilogram of body mass, the metal was significantly more persistent in the body than other radioactive metals like radium. Whereas around 20% of absorbed radium is excreted by the body within one day, the initial excretion rate for plutonium was found to be less than 10% per day, quickly dropping to barely 0.01%. This persistence made plutonium a significantly greater health hazard than the Manhattan Project directors had initially suspected. But there was a bigger problem. The vital ratio between plutonium in the urine and plutonium in the blood was found to vary widely between different species of laboratory animals, making these results difficult to apply to humans. Furthermore, there seemed to be no correlation between plutonium levels in nose swabs and in blood and urine tests, throwing the utility of the former test into question. The health section researchers quickly realized that animal experiments were not enough. If they were to develop acute human models for plutonium absorption and excretion, they would have to experiment on actual humans. But there was a catch. At the time, the very existence of plutonium was such a closely guarded secret that even in highly classified documents, it was only ever referred to as products or by the code number 49. Test subjects could therefore not be told what they were being injected with or the purpose of the experiments, making informed consent impossible. Consequently, in a March 1945 meeting between Lewis Hempelman and Lieutenant Colonel Heimer Friedel of the Manhattan Project Medical Section, the decision was made to conduct the experiments on civilian hospital patients with terminal conditions, such that the subjects were likely to die long before the effects of plutonium became apparent. Thus began one of the darkest chapters in the history of American medical science. The first unwitting participant in the plutonium experiment was Eb Cade, a 55-year-old black man working as a cement mixer at Oak Ridge. On March 23, 1945, Cade sustained severe leg and arm fractures in an automobile accident and was admitted to Oak Ridge Hospital. There, medical section researcher Harold Hodge judged that as a well-developed, well-nourished, colored male, Cade was an ideal test subject and assigned him the code number HP12, H standing for 
human product. On April the 10th, Cade was injected with 4.7 micrograms of plutonium, and over the next 42 days, doctors collected samples of his blood, urine, and feces, which were sent to Los Alamos for analysis. The doctors also refused to set his broken bones for 10 days so bone samples could be taken and extracted 15 of his perfectly healthy teeth. Cade must have known something nefarious was going on, for he eventually fled his hospital room in the middle of the night and never returned. He died of heart failure in April 1953 at the age of 63. The next test subject was a 68-year-old male patient at Billings Hospital in Chicago with advanced metastatic cancer who was only suspected to live another 160 days. Known only by his experimental designation of CHI-1, the patient was injected on April 26, 1945 with 6.5 milligrams of plutonium. As before, urine and fecal samples were collected daily until his death, whereupon his body was autopsied and bone and tissue samples were collected for analysis. The third test subject was Albert Stevens, a 58-year-old California house painter who, in May 1945, was diagnosed with terminal stomach cancer and given six months to live. On May the 14th, Stevens, who was given the experimental designation CAL-1, was admitted to the University of California Hospital in San Francisco and injected with one microgram of plutonium-238, an isotope 276 times more radioactive than the plutonium-239 used in nuclear weapons. But when Stevens underwent surgery to remove some of his tumors, it was discovered that his doctors had made a huge mistake. Stevens did not in fact have cancer, but rather a benign stomach ulcer. Nevertheless, Manhattan Project scientists continued to monitor his urine plutonium levels, calling him back to the hospital several times a year under the pretense of monitoring his non-existent cancer. Amazingly, despite the dangerous amounts of plutonium in his body, Stevens appeared to suffer no ill effects and died of heart disease in 1966 at the age of 79. Over the intervening 21 years, Stevens is estimated to have absorbed some 64 sieverts of radiation, the highest dose known to have been survived by any human. And for more on how radiation exposure works, please do check out our previous video, How Much Radiation Can the Human Body Take? Their grossly unethical nature aside, the results of these first three experiments proved extremely valuable. As the animal studies had suggested, the excretion rate for plutonium was extremely low compared to other metals like radium and up to six times lower in humans than in animals. This meant that nearly all the plutonium absorbed by the human body was retained for decades, with Joseph Hamilton of the Berkeley Group estimating its metabolic half-life, that is, the time for half the plutonium to be excreted, to be nearly 50 years. Based on these results, Hamilton recommended that the maximum exposure for plutonium workers be lowered from 5 micrograms to 1 microgram. But the experimental results weren't perfect, with Hamilton noting that the test subjects exhibited certain physiological abnormalities. For example, Ebb Cage and CHI1 exhibited unusually low urination rates and abnormal kidney function, likely the result of chronic gonorrhea and old age respectively. As these subjects did not accurately represent the young, healthy Manhattan Project workers who were regularly handling plutonium, in October 1945 it was decided to proceed with another round of human experiments. This time the study would be far more controlled, with subjects carefully selected to ensure their kidneys, liver, and bone marrow were functioning normally. These subjects would be monitored for 10 days prior to injecting them with plutonium to determine the baseline level of radioactivity in their bodies and placed on a standard diet in order to eliminate as many variables as possible. As before, however, few were informed that they were participating in potentially dangerous research, and those who were were only given the vaguest idea of the nature and risks of the experiment. Over the next year, a further 15 patients were secretly injected with plutonium, 11 in Rochester, 2 in Chicago, and 2 at Berkeley. All but two were over 45 years of age and suffered from chronic or terminal conditions like cancer, ALS, Cushing syndrome, and Addison's disease, criteria specifically chosen so the radiological effects of the plutonium would not become apparent until the end of their natural lives. Unlike in the first trial, these subjects were injected with multiple regular doses of plutonium until they died, with one of the Chicago subjects, a young man with Hodgkin's lymphoma, receiving a whopping total of 95 micrograms. But it is the case of Simeon Shaw, one of the two remaining subjects, which perhaps epitomizes the cruel and cynical nature of the whole project. On February the 6th, 1946, four-year-old Shaw, a resident of the town of Dubbo, Australia, fell out of his hammock and struck his right knee. Ten days later, his mother Frieda noticed a large, rapidly growing mass on the inside of his right thigh, which was eventually diagnosed as the rare and aggressive bone cancer, osteogenic sarcoma. With no treatment available in Australia, Frieda Shaw attempted to bring her son to the United States, only to find that no commercial flights were available. Fortuitously, the Red Cross intervened and secured a seat for the Shaws aboard a U.S. Army Air Force 
Cosmos transport bound for San Francisco. Simeon and his mother arrived in the United States on April the 26th and were driven by Red Cross ambulance to the University of California Hospital. There, Simeon was subjected to a series of injections and bone and tissue biopsies as part of his cancer treatment, or so Frieda Shaw was told. As you might have guessed, Simeon, codenamed CAL2 by Manhattan Project researchers, had actually been injected with 2.7 micrograms of plutonium, and once his urine analysis was completed seven days later, he was discharged from hospital without any further treatment or follow-up. The boy and his mother returned to Australia, where Simeon died a month later on January 6, 1947. The plutonium injection experiments finally came to an end in late 1946 when control of the United States nuclear arsenal was transferred from the Army to the Civilian Atomic Energy Commission, now the Department of Energy. As the AEC's greater burden of transparency had the potential to expose the plutonium experiments to public scrutiny, in April of 1947 the Commission issued a memo recommending that all human experimentation remain top secret. As a result, no follow-ups were conducted on the surviving 11 test subjects who lived out the rest of their lives unaware that they had been injected with a dangerous dangerous radioactive substance. In 1950, Joseph Hamilton wrote an additional memo to the AEC recommending that all further human experiments be discontinued as well, quipping darkly that the proposed studies a little of the Buchenwald touch. But Hamilton's plea was ignored, and over the following decades, the United States government would conduct dozens of secret radiation experiments on its own citizens. In Boston, 11 hospital patients were injected with uranium. In Chicago, 102 people received injections of radioactive strontium and cesium. In Nashville, hundreds of pregnant women were given various radioactive mixtures to gauge their effect on their unborn children. And at the Fernand State School in Massachusetts, 74 developmentally delayed boys were fed oatmeal laced with radioactive traces as part of a study sponsored by MIT and the Quaker Oats Company. In no case was informed consent properly obtained from the subjects of these experiments. While the raw data of the 1940s plutonium injection experiments was eventually made available to the scientific community, thanks to the AEC's policy of secrecy, the names of the subjects and many of the details of the experiments remained classified for decades. Then, in 1993, investigative journalist Eileen Wilson published a Pulitzer Prize-winning series of articles in the Albuquerque Tribune exposing the long-forgotten experiments and revealing the identities of five of the test subjects. The articles, which later formed the basis for the 1999 book The Plutonium Files, caused a public uproar, prompting U.S. President Bill Clinton to form the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments, headed by Secretary of Energy Hazel O'Leary. The committee made thousands of previously classified documents available to the public and launched a full investigation into the past deeds of the DOE. The committee's report, released in 1995, determined that even according to the standards of the time, the plutonium injection studies failed entirely to obtain proper informed consent from the subjects, concluding, The egregiousness of the disrespectful way in which the subjects of the injection experiments and their families were treated is heightened by the fact that the subjects were hospitalized patients. Their being ill and institutionalized left them vulnerable to exploitation. These facts will force historians to rewrite part of the history of the dawn of the atomic age. The report failed to make much mention of the public impact having the misfortune of being released on the same day as the O.J. Simpson trial verdict. However, as a result of its findings, the families of many of the test subjects were awarded financial compensation by the government, and in 1997, federal laws were passed prohibiting secret scientific experimentation on humans and upholding the principles of the Nuremberg Code regarding informed consent. Yet, while the plutonium injection experiments have become a classic example of unethical Cold War science, they do have their modern-day defenders. These include Patricia Durbin, a physicist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, who in the 1970s was among the first scientists to re-examine the original experimental data. Durbin argued that, so far as can be determined, the experiments did no actual harm to the test subjects. All 18 died from causes unrelated to the injected plutonium, with eight living at least twice as long as the minimum four-year interval for the development of radiation-induced cancer. Indeed, several subjects are known to have actually benefited from the experiments, including HP6, a woman with Addison's disease who, through her experiment-related hospital stays, was able to receive proper hormone treatments, and HP3, a woman suffering for severe weight loss who, thanks to the experiments, was diagnosed with severe depression, treated, and went on to live another 37 years. As for the issue of informed consent, Durbin argued that the subjects were told as much as possible given the extreme secrecy surrounding the use of plutonium, and justified the experiments as a whole on the 
basis of the valuable medical information obtained, saying, quote, They were always conducted on somebody who had some kind of terminal disease who was going to undergo an amputation. These things were not done to plague people or make them sick and miserable. They were done not to kill people. They were done to gain potentially valuable information. The fact that they were injected and provided this valuable data should almost be a sort of memorial rather than something to be ashamed of. It doesn't bother me to talk about the plutonium injectees because of the value of the information they provided. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.